my name is Julie. I'm a supply chain manager. So demand forecasting and inventory planning is part of my job. I used to grapple with large data sets and on Excel sheet, you know, trying to forecast future trends. Recently, I have adopted machine learning, particularly time series forecasting, because most uh, historic sales data from your ERP system, typically chronological and uh, there's no correlation between all the products sold. Uh, so today I want to show you two examples how to use machine learning for prediction. So before we get started, I uh, want to have a brief introduction on the models. I uh, asked GPT to list some of the time series models. So uh, here's uh, Arima and Profit, and basically these models are um, you know, inherently can handle time series data and directly accommodate features like seasonality and trends for random forest and XG boost. Uh, these are regression models. So uh, basically the way we use them is we will engineer some features before we uh, tr uh, train the model with data sets. So mo model basically, uh, you know, can predict the future based on those features. And um, so we have S STM, uh, this is neural network models, uh, so it's in the uh, deep learning space. There are a lot of models. I want to just show you uh, two examples. So here's the raw data uh, I just I found on Kaggle. I think it's, um, uh, it's a retail uh, sales report, basically. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a real data because most companies, obviously, they will not publish their proprietary data. But um, so basically this is product one, two, three, four, and uh, this is sales quantity, sales revenue, and here's the date. Uh, it's in a daily frequency. Uh, you can see the daily quantity, sales quantity is pretty high. It's all in the thousands, you know. Uh, sometimes you sell over 7,000 pieces per day. In the supply chain, like zoom out, see the monthly market, uh, shifting which direction you know last last month or like si last six months or last year and then you kind of plan inventory based on that so we have uh, based uh, roughly 12 uh 12 years of data years so today i'm not going to show you the python language how to code all these uh, just basically i want to show you the step by step and uh, what's the logic behind all these so basically, you are um, you open up uh, a, a Google Colab. Uh, is upload uh, your raw data here, and uh, and then you import a bunch of packages and libraries here. Uh, and uh, so at the beginning, we want to kind of uh, visualize the data to get some insight, to get some information. So I like I said, uh, this is uh, like I mentioned previously. This is sales uh, daily quantity. So I tried to plot the, uh, the daily uh, sales quantity. Obviously, uh, since it's over 12 years uh, time span, you know, in terms of data sets, uh, if we want to plot all the way from 2010 to, uh, to 2023, uh, the, the, the chart looks messy, but you still can get some insight. For example, here you can see uh, product one um, has the highest sales quantity and uh, product three in the green dots uh, contributes to the highest sales revenue. And um, so, like I mentioned, we, in the daily practice, in, in supply chain operation, you don't want to uh, just looking at the data day to day, uh, you know, it's just not practical. So you want to uh, forecast demand, you want to plan inventory based on your forecast. You want to kind of zoom out, like I said, uh, you aggregate the data. Uh, so here I just uh, resample data to aggregate the daily quantity into uh, monthly. And then I just plot the monthly data again. So the chart looks much prettier and cleaner um, than you can observe uh, here. You know, this, uh, you don't see any kind of major market shift or demand shift over time. There's no upward or downward trend here. You know, the, 
product the one, two, three, four, they all look kind of consistent. So, um, so like I said before, I'm not sure if it's the real data published on Kaggle, um, because like in most uh, e-com or retail or even you know a distributor, wholesale company, I don't think. Yeah, I'm not sure. So, but anyways, here's the data, and then uh, I basically I want to look deep into it, and uh, so I plotted the product one sales quantity uh, for the last because our data ends basically on the uh, 23 January uh, 31. So I want to see what's the past 12 months uh, sales product one from 2020 January until 23 January, we don't see any obvious uh, shift like upward or downward, but uh, we can see here um, in, in January, it, the sales quantity is kind of spiked. Product two generally has had the highest uh, sales quantity. And uh, so, so we could uh, kind of like speculate they probably have some promotion in the new year. Uh, so that could be the case. And uh, here is the histogram. Histograms are used basically used to detect outliers. Monthly sales for product one, <coughs> it's basically this uh, in this range. So you can basically tell this is probably outlier. So <coughs> and then the same goes to P two. This is probably outlier, and then this is you can see um, we can you know tell it's probably outlier. So uh, with machine learning, before we uh, split the data into train and then test, we spend a lot of time on pre-process, clean the data. So because if you uh, don't remove the outlier, the, the mod model tend to overfitting. Also mentioned at the beginning. Um, <coughs> so let's assume a company, they have four, just four products, uh, w which is not true. You know, a lot of companies, they have hundreds, you know, in terms of SKU numbers, they probably have like thousands of SKU numbers, you know, which is uh, each represents each product. So each product, they really, I would say they are independent. There's no correlation between products. Um, so that's why I hear I just basically slice the data to extract the only the sales quantity for P1 and uh, here the date column as index. And uh, since I resampled from daily to monthly, this example I show you is we are trying to use XGBoost, which is one of the very power for our regression models. Um, so the way we use XGBoost, we need to engineer some features first. So because it's time series data, uh, there's, um, we can create some temporal features, you know, for example, um, day of the week or day of the month. Uh, but since uh, we have, this is monthly data here, uh, so we don't need a day of the week, day of the month. Uh, I, I don't think that that feature will be helpful, uh, you know, in this scenario. So I just basically added a uh, lag feature and a monthly, quarter, yearly feature, lag feature, lag 12, lag um, 24 months. This is basically um, here, like we just looking back 12 months ago, what is the sales quantity starting from this day? Um, you know, then we extract the value and he, here, same goes to, so this uh, value is basically, okay, starting from 23, uh, January 31, if we looking back 24 months ago, what is the sales quantity? And then we extract value here. Um, that's why at the beginning you see the data is here's NAN because our whole data sets starting from uh, you know 2010. If you wanna uh, extract a value um, previously, um, there obviously there's no data. That's why we only have NAN. Um, XG Boost is very powerful. It can handle NAN values. In most scenarios, you wanna train uh, multiple models. So 
uh, you need to kind of process these NAND values. I want to get into the how to implement a uh, train test split. So like I mentioned uh, at the beginning, we have 12 years of data here. So it's, it's probably enough data we can split the, the data into um, five folds uh, here, you know, just kind of visualize it to better understanding what is the five folds uh, across validation. Basically, the way we do that is well, the more we train the model, uh, the, the model performs better. So that's how uh, if we have uh, enough time spam, let's say like 10 years of the data, a worth of data, or even sometimes 20 years worth of data, you can do cross validation. And uh, basically it depends on the, how large is your data set. So we train the model, we split the uh, five folds, we, we train, uh, we iterate, you know, and then here's the result. Uh, so like I said, the more you train, uh, validate, train, validate, um, the better the performance is. So you can tell from the uh, metrics, you know, here we use the uh, root mean squared error metrics to evaluate uh, performance. So you can see um, at the last iteration, uh, the score is uh, much better than the than previous scores. Uh, but the number is still pretty big, but you have to remember, um, like I resampled the data into uh, monthly sales and uh, you can see monthly sales is, um, you know, six digits. It's pretty large, you know, it's all over basically, they're all over six digits. And here the, uh, the root uh, mean squared error is in the low five digits. So I would say the model performs very well here. I had also experimented uh, a 80% uh, and 20% train test split to uh, see what is the um, uh, score. And uh, it scored pretty good. So it's just a brief example uh, for XG boost. Uh, so obviously there's a lot more going into this, you can uh, tune the, uh, you know, hyperparameters. So uh, here's another example. It's uh, auto sales I found on Kaggle. It's also in the daily frequency, but uh, it's the, the date column is pretty messy, you can see. And uh, daily quantities in uh, two digits sometimes. And um, is the product code basically SKU number. So in most cases, you know, you extract uh, historic sales data from EIP system. It, it, it will look like this. Uh, we have custom name, address. Uh, this is probably uh, like e-com business, auto parts maybe. Uh, we upload it and we import a bunch of packages and we want to kind of visualize it. Uh, first. So here, um, I want to, like I said, clean data is super important. So we have a lot of uh, columns. This information are mostly not useful, like shipped, uh, you know, the address, customer name, so on and so forth. It's, it's not important uh, in, in terms of demand forecasting, inventory planning, you know. So you want to uh, remove, just clean, remove those columns and then get the clean data um, here. And uh, I also want to find, these are the SKU numbers basically, uh, each uh, represents a uh, unique uh, auto parts. We have a number of unique product codes, uh, 109 and uh, you can just manipulate data to have each SKU numbers for each um, column. And uh, here you can see uh, the sales is not that good, uh, meaning on this day, uh, this SKU number has no zero sales. Again, I resample data to um, from daily to monthly. 
and then uh, this is how uh, what we uh, get so January 2018 basically we have zero sales for this SKU number and uh, but here for this SKU numbers we have 26 pieces so we're trying to visualize it to get some insights so I just plot the here the first six SKU numbers because you can see basically 2018 and 2019 both clear around that you know November to December I would say the sales spiked so you can kind of speculate that maybe they have some uh, Black Friday sales promotions and um, and uh, again I plotted the bar chart uh, see uh, it's the same thing basically spiked uh, in, uh, during that period of time but other than that uh, in terms of the uh, or the uh, rest of the month you don't see any clear patterns here so some months you have zero sales some months you have uh, you know the overall quantity is not that great yeah you can see all the quantity sales quantity spiked during November to uh, December so they probably had some kind of promotion. And uh, here's the histogram. Again, um, we don't see a concentration uh, in terms of the sales quantity distribution. It's kind of spread out. Uh, you know, like some months we sold over 100, and some months we have we sold, we only sold 20 pieces, you know. So it's pretty spread out. And um, so in this case, I want to show you how to use profit, um, which is a, a Facebook model. Uh, we don't need to engineer features because it's, it's, it's just built for time series forecasting purposes. I used uh, the, the first SKU number, which was this number, uh, to try to see the model performance. And, uh, and I plotted the model performance, the forecast versus actual sales. So it's not that great uh, for that particular SKU numbers. The actual sold zero, you know, they sold zero pieces uh, on the 2020 uh, January, but uh, the model forecasted close to 60 pieces and then this is uh, actual so 20 pieces and predicted 50 pieces but uh, towards the end of the data we see uh, the value gets closer so and then so we first we train just kind of building blocks we first use the, the first skew to to see what is the and then since we have uh, 109 skew numbers you are uh, in Python you can use for loop to um, to iterate over all the skew numbers and uh, to get the results so here again uh, we are using so in this case we're using mean squared error and mean absolute error mean squared error we punish larger penalties basic uh, this skew numbers uh, the squared error mean squared error is in the hundreds so it's not ideal you know you see uh the, on the test set the the squared error is <laughs> over a thousand i think the reason is we have uh only in, in this case we only have two years of data sets here less than two year and a half of the uh, worth of data set so sometimes model doesn't perform that good if you only have very limited uh, data but uh, you can see it's kind of improving as on some SKU numbers for when a train the train uh, squared error is this but on a test set it's significant improved compared to this absolute error this is it's the delta between prediction and actual so this is um, obviously still not so good but it's uh, better than this one obviously and then for this skew number uh, this is uh, already much better uh, so so basically in in most cases we use different models so in this we just demo uh we you usually we will use uh, multiple models 
and we try to get the best model and then we tune the hyperparameter of that model and then we train the whole data sets uh, uh, if we want to predict into the future 